I'm Simon, I'm a postdoc at the University of Washington, and I should say that I'm on the job market later this year, so if you have a job, come and talk to me, I'd be happy to chat. Okay, this talk is about one of my recent projects, it is an operating system called Arrakis that is able to deliver very high I.O. performance, uh, in particular to server applications, by partitioning the operating system into a control plane and into a data plane component. And this is worked together with a number of folks from uh, the Systems and Networks Labs at the University of Washington, you've seen most of them just a couple of minutes ago, as well as with Matthew Roscoe from ETH Zurich. Okay, so the overarching goal within the Arrakis project was to build an operating system for the data center. It should be pretty clear that I.O. performance matters in particular to server applications. Key value stores, web and file servers, lock managers, and so forth are all principally measured by the latency and throughput with, with which they can carry out client operations. So we asked ourselves the question, can we build an operating system that would allow these applications to deliver performance very close to that delivered by current data center hardware technology? To understand what current data center hardware technology is, let's have a look uh, at an example system, the Dell PowerEdge R520, which I'm going to use as a running example throughout the rest of the, uh, of the talk, and this is also the system that we carried out all of our evaluation on. So let's look inside the system, starting with uh, I.O. devices. Uh, the first one here is the Intel X520 dual-port 10 gigabit Ethernet controller that's inside the system. Then we have an Intel RS3 RAID controller, and this RAID controller contains one gigabyte of cache memory that is backed by flash. So this is a piece of persistent memory, essentially. And then we have a Sandy Bridge CPU with six cores at 2.2 gigahertz. And the last time I checked, you could buy the system straight off Dell for around $1,200. So this is really a commodity data center server system, not some fancy expensive new technology. And just to give you guys a handle on what the I.O. performance of the system is, let's consider one more example here. Let's assume that we are receiving one kilobyte size packets, so fairly large packets, at line rate at one of the ports of our 10 gigabit Ethernet controller. In that case, we're talking at an, a packet in our arrival rate at the server of about two microseconds. So that gives you a handle of what the headroom is that we have within the operating system to do I.O. processing, not very much. Similarly, the rate controller is able to persist a one kilobyte sized write operation to its local persistent cache within 25 microseconds. So the takeaway here is that today's I.O. devices are really, really fast. However, we might still ask the question, can't we just run Linux on, on such a system? After all, it should be the canonical choice for it. So let's examine that. Let's look at Linux I.O. performance. In particular, let's take a popular data center server application, in this case, the Redis Persistent Key Value Store, which you see here at the top of the, of the slide. Redis is able to serve client GET requests straight out of server uh, main memory. And in addition to that, it can persist set requests to stable storage via an operational log that it writes to a file. Below Redis then here on the slide you see Linux's I.O. architecture where the, the Linux kernel, as is common for a monolithic operating system, is directly involved on the data path between Redis and our two I.O. devices here at the bottom of the slide. And just for reference, I kept those two numbers, those two example numbers down there, and I'd ask you to keep those in mind because what we're going to do now is we're going to benchmark Redis using one kilobyte sized operations, both get and, and set requests that match those operations for the hardware devices, and we're going to see what the server-sided latency of, of Redis is. And we're going to pop this up here. Um, on the right, uh, up, uh, on the right to the to the bars, you'll see the total server-sided latency, and then we broke that latency up at the server into time spent uh, in the hardware, time spent in the Linux kernel, and time spent within the Redis application itself, and that's the, the bar chart that you see here. And there are two takeaways from these numbers. First, looking at the total latency spent at the server, the nine microseconds for a GET request and a grand total of 163 microseconds for an average one kilobyte size set request, um, we can see that we're quite far away from delivering the, the raw performance of our I.O. devices. And then the second takeaway is by looking at that, that bar chart, we can see that we can spend an awfully long time within the Linux kernel. 62% uh, for uh, a GET request and 84% for a SET request. 
Uh, to understand why that is, we have to remind ourselves that the kernel here is directly on the data path um, between Redis and those I.O. devices. So we have to invoke it for each and every I.O. operation that we are carrying out. And the Linux kernel has to do a long list of things in, in software here for, for our applications. Uh, for example, it, it carries out the multiplexing of these devices to potentially multiple applications running inside the system. It has to enforce resource limits. It has to carry out I.O. scheduling. It has to uh, provide access control and so forth. All of these directly on the data path each time we invoke uh, the Linux kernel for an I.O. operation. And the, the takeaway of that is that kernel mediation is just too heavyweight for the vast performance offered by, by current data center I.O. devices. So in Arrakis, the goal must be instead to somehow skip the operating system kernel and deliver I.O. directly to applications, network packets, disk blocks, and so forth, to reduce this operating system overhead that I've shown you on the previous slide. At the same time, however, we'd like to keep all the features that we've grown accustomed to in a classical server operating system, such as the protection among multiple different processes, the enforcement of resource limits, uh, the flexibility to roll out our own I.O. protocols, or just a global naming system like a global file system. So how can we achieve that? Well, it turns out that uh, current data center server hardware can help us with that quite a bit already. And the key word here is hardware I.O. virtualization, which is already standard on uh, data center and, uh, network interface cards, and it's an emerging technology for rate controllers and or other storage technologies in the data center. It turns out that our I.O. devices are already perfectly able to multiplex themselves to multiple different principles running within our operating system. The enabling technology here is called SRIOV, which is short for single root I.O. virtualization. This is a PCI standard that allows PCI devices to create virtual copies of themselves uh, on the PCI bus that each have their own register sets, their own descriptor queues, their own interrupts. So virtually everything that we need to drive such a virtual copy straight from within a user level application. We just have to link an, an IO stack and, and a device driver into that application and we're virtually done. Um, Protection is also already provided by current service systems. Most servers today contain an IOMMU, um, which we can use to restrict uh, a device's access to only uh, an application's virtual memory, for example. We just point the IOMMU at that application's page table, uh, attach that particular IOMMU to, the, um, uh, to a virtual device, and then we're, we're done. The IOMMU will do the rest of the job for us. Finally, one thing that we still need is a way to restrict applications from carrying out arbitrary I.O. We'd only like to uh, have applications only carry out I.O. operations that they're eligible to, to carry out, such as a server system for uh, a server application, for example, to only receive packets that have the IP address of that server and only of a particular port number. Similarly, on the send side, we'd like to be able to restrict the server application to only send packets with a particular signature. And again, it turns out that uh, our hardware devices can already provide that for us. The Intel X520 NIC, for example, of which you see uh, an example here on the right-hand side, um, contains packet filters. Uh, which can be used to program what is essentially a little switch that sits on the, the 10 gigabit Ethernet interface uh, to classify incoming traffic uh, with, these, with, with these packet filters and direct it uh, directly to user-level virtual NIC instances according to these packet filters. Similarly, on the outgoing path, there are filters you can program that uh, can set the switch to drop packets if they don't match the signature of, of those filters. The story is similar for the RAID controller. RAID controllers are traditionally able to provide logical disks that are uh, a representation of a subset of the physical disk space, and we can configure these logical disks to match those bits that the application should be eligible to access, and then the application will use that, that logical disk for, for access. Finally, I.O. scheduling is also already provided uh, within current hardware. Again, going back to the X520 NIC, uh, that NIC contains rate limiters as well as packet schedulers that we can directly program according to uh, system administrator's I.O. scheduling policy. So with that in mind, it actually becomes fairly straightforward to skip the operating system kernel in the common case. The first thing we're going to do is move these three operations protection, multiplexing, and I.O. scheduling down into hardware, as that's where uh, that functionality is already provided. This then allows us in turn to move the API and all of the I.O. processing up 
into applications themselves. We just link them into the applications as a, as a library. Um, and because I.O. devices now operate directly on application virtual memory, we can eliminate the copying that the Linux kernel traditionally does in order to provide protection. And in our case, we can then provide a zero copy uh, I.O. Uh, stack. And that leaves us with these three operations within the, the kernel. Naming, in particular global naming, access control, as well as the configuration of resource limits. So let's see if we can somehow also move that aside. Uh, let's get back to that a little later. First, I'd like to clear up the slide a little. So this is the same slide, just cleared up for better readability. And this gives us the Arrakis I.O. architecture, where you can now clearly see that the, the kernel is off the data path of our applications. And applications have this direct connection to uh, their own dedicated virtual instance of an I.O. device. And this is what we call the control plane, data plane separation within the operating system. The kernel sits on the control plane, and the applications and the I.O. devices sit on the, on the data plane. And the idea here is that the control plane will only be infrequently invoked to configure and set up the, the fast data plane. So how does all of that work? So we already covered uh, the I.O. devices to, to the great length. So let's focus first on the kernel. How does that uh, carry out? It's three operations that I mentioned before. Let's first talk about the easy two, which is access control and resource limits. Uh, so it turns out that with this architecture, we only need to carry out access control once when the application comes up and we configure the, the data plane for that application. At that point, we figure out what the set of uh, I.O. operations is that the application should be able to, to carry out. And we then uh, program the NIC filters and the logical disks to enforce uh, th that access control uh, within hardware in the, in the common case on the data path. Resource limits are similar. We just uh, program the hardware I.O. schedulers in the hardware according to a system administrator's resource uh, uh, limit policy. Global naming then is a little bit uh, harder. Um, we'd, we'd like to still provide a global file system that the user of this system has grown uh, accustomed to. So we keep the virtual file system inside the kernel. But of course, the implementation of all storage I.O. is now done within applications themselves. So, so how do we do that? Uh, in order to explain that, I'd like to get back to the Redis example here, which you see at the top left-hand side of, of the slide. In this example, Redis already has a virtual instance of uh, the RAID controller mapped into its virtual address space that it can then use via uh, a library I.O. stack uh, with fast hardware operations to, to carry out I.O. And the, the area that Redis is carrying I.O. out on, we call a virtual storage area. A uh, virtual storage area is just a linear representation of some possibly fragmented physical disk space. And the idea is that this is directly provided by uh, a logical disk that is implemented by the RAID controller. Uh, so on top of this virtual storage area, uh, Redis can now carry out any storage I.O. operation it, it likes. It can store data in any format, whatever is most performant for, its, uh, for itself. Um, and uh, in addition to that, it can give objects names. And it can register these names with the kernel virtual file system. So in this example, Redis might have a lock file. It has the actual key value database. And then it might have a configuration file. And all of these names are registered with the, with the kernel. So uh, if we now fire up another application, let's say in uh, our editor Emacs to, to edit uh, the configuration file, Emacs has no idea in what format that, that config file is, is stored. So what Emacs is going to do instead is it's going to uh, issue a, a regular open system call to the kernel, to that configuration file. And uh, the kernel virtual file system now knows that Redis is the application responsible for implementing the, the storage of that configuration file. So it's going to redirect Emacs to the Redis application via an indirect IPC interface that is uh, POSIX compliant. And Redis, uh, Emacs can then uh, carry out, uh, um, sorry, access the config file uh, using Redis's I.O. library. OK, that covers the, the kernel. Now I'd quickly like to highlight uh, uh, one cool thing that we can now do on the, on the data plane to get really good uh, performance, given that we, we now have the API and all of the I.O. processing linked directly into the application, which allows us to easily tailor those things to an application. Uh, and the, my highlight here is on the, the storage data plane. Um, one thing that we can now do is change the, the API and the storage implementation. Um, and in this case, um, we, we changed it to one of persistent data structures. 
Um, what are persistent data structures? Well, you can think of them just like regular data structures. Examples would be a log or a queue, except that all of the operations that we execute on those persistent data structures are made immediately persistent on some backing store, like, like a disk. And this has several benefits. Uh, firstly, we can make the in-memory layout of these data structures equal to the on-disk layout of these data structures, which allows us to eliminate all of the marshalling that applications typically do when they serialize out their in-memory data structures to stable storage. It also allows us to carry all of the metadata that we need to persist this data structures right within the data structure itself, which allows for the early allocation of that metadata. For example, if Redis were to allocate a new log entry uh, just in memory, we can allocate all of the metadata we need to persist that entry right at that point in anticipation that Redis will soon call the append operation, which is the actual persistent operation of the, of the data structure. And then we can just flush out that metadata uh, together with the application data immediately. And, and due to the spatial locality of the metadata to the actual application data, we uh, are able to flush out both of them together in one write operation, which uh, reduces the number of write operations we would have to do versus a file system, which which typically persists its inode table separate to the, uh, the actual application data. On the read side, we can then also do uh, data structure-specific caching as well as prefetching due to the higher-level semantics of the, of the data structure. Uh, for example, we know that um, a, a log is only accessed uh, sequentially, so we can do serial prefetching of entries of the, of the log. And uh, now to, to uh, measure the, the uh, performance of these data structures, we went ahead and modified Redis to use our persistent log implementation instead of its own log. Uh, that was a, a fairly straightforward change. It involved the change of 109 lines of code inside Redis. It basically consisted of ripping out Redis's log implementation and putting ours in. The uh, APIs were exactly identical. And as we will see now in the evaluation part of my talk, uh, this now provides vast uh, performance benefits, uh, both in latency as well as throughput. Uh, let's first talk about Redis latency. Um, first off, we just talk about get operations. So this only invo involves the Arrakis uh, network stack, not the, uh, the persistent data structures yet. Uh, we were able to reduce the latency of in-memory get operations by 65% versus Linux from nine microseconds down to four microseconds. And by the breakdown graphs here, you can see that we're now spending a lot less time in our library I.O. stack to carry out the I.O. processing. In Arrakis's case, just 35% versus 62 in, in Linux. And then using both the Arrakis network stack and the persistent data structures, we were able to reduce the latency of persistent set operations in Redis by 81%, from 163 microseconds in Linux running on top of the extended fourth file system to 31% in Arrakis, uh, which is now very close to the latency provided by our hardware devices. And again, in the breakdown, you can see that we spend only 7% of the time in our library I.O. stack carrying out I.O. operations. The rest is spent in the hardware and uh, a little bit in the application, respectively. These latency results then translate into great throughput results as well. Uh, we were able to improve the throughput of Redis get operations by 1.75x versus Linux, and that of set operations by a grand total of 9x versus Linux. So great improvements in performance. Um, our library I.O. stacks also scale very well very well, and I'd like to show you, uh, you that with uh, an example here using the memcache in memory key value store. The reason for using memcache here is that it's a multi-threaded key value store implementation, whereas Redis is a single-threaded application. And the benchmark that we ran here is uh, similar to the one ran in Redis. We run a, a mix of get and set operations. So you can see the details in the paper, and we then measure peak uh, throughput of, of memcached uh, over multiple different core uh, a number of core configurations. And that's what you see here on the graph. Uh, on the y-axis, you have the throughput and thousands of transactions per second. And the x-axis then is the scalability graph as we vary the number of memcache threads. And then the blue box is the Linux operating system, and the orange box is Arrakis. And you can see that due to uh, the lightweight nature of our library I.O. stack, um, we already improved the uh, throughput on just a single core by 1.8x. and uh, uh, Memcached then scales up linearly on Arrakis up until we hit the line rate of our 10 gigabit Ethernet interface at four cores, and we're now 3.1x as fast as Linux is. 
Linux, uh, as you can see here, does not scale as well. It basically tapers out after around two to three cores and then stays flat. And the reason for this is that the Linux uh, network stack, of course, is much, much more heavyweight. It has to provide all different features that uh, are con you can conceivably run on, on a service system because it is globally shared among all different applications. And so it contains lots of logs and complicated data structures. We are able to um, strip down our library I.O. stacks because they're dedicated to individual applications to just provide the features that we need for an individual application and, and thus we can simplify the, the architecture of our library I.O. stacks and eliminate a lot of locks. Finally, I'd like to show you uh, just raw performance on a single core using a UDP echo benchmark. Um, this is again a throughput benchmark, so on the y-axis here you see throughput in thousands of packets per second, and on the x-axis then you have the comparison among different system, system configurations. Starting first here on the left-hand side with, with Linux with a normalized performance of 1x. Taking that UDP echo server over to um, uh, Arrakis, just running on the regular POSIX interface, then gives us a speed up of 2.3x versus Linux. We can then go and modify that interface a little bit to provide a zero copy I.O. interface, uh, which provides us a speed up of 3.4x versus Linux, which is very close to the practical limit on this server, which would be the one echoing packets back straight at the device driver. Uh, just writing the minimum amount of code to do that, which is the last bar, which has a speed up of 3.6x versus Linux. And you can see here that these last two bars are uh, very close again to the line rate at the top of the graph um, of our 10 gigabit Ethernet interface. And, and so it's, it's fair to say that with Arrakis we're able to uh, drive a, uh, one port of the 10 gigabit Ethernet interface at almost line rate with, with just a single core. So to summarize, the operating system is becoming an I.O. bottleneck, in particular to server applications. And the main reason for that is that these globally shared I.O. stacks, uh, such as in Linux, are very heavyweight and slow uh, when they are directly on the data path of applications. In Arrakis, we are eliminating this overhead by splitting the operating system into a control plane and into a data plane component, which allows us to carry out direct application level I.O. operations on the data path, as well as to build specialized I.O. libraries for these applications. And uh, these application level I.O. stacks then deliver great performance. Among other things, I've shown you up to 9x improvements in throughput, throughput for the Redis key value store and in 81% speed up in terms of latency. And they also scale very well. I've shown you uh, that memcached can scale linear, uh, linearly up till it hits the line rate of our 10 gigabit Ethernet interface. Uh, and at that point, it provides 3x the throughput of, of Linux. The source code to Arrakis is available. Please go to our website, arrakis.cs.washington.edu, where you can download it uh, and run your own experiments on it or even contribute to the operating system. And uh, that, that's all I had. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm ready to answer questions. Yes, John Criswell, University of Rochester. Um, so if I understand correctly, what you're doing is you're actually allowing applications directly to directly access the, the uh, control and data registers on the actual device, on the virtual devices provided by the hardware devices. Correct. Um, if so, how do you think that would compare to, say, the Linux kernel making these virtual devices available as device files where they can actually access it through the slash dev system but not actually going through file system and so forth. Yeah, uh, great question. Thank you very much. Um, that, that brings me straight to related work, which I kind of left out of the talk in the interest of time. Um, so there, there is actually a related work where people try to, to do this to keep kind of the Linux architecture intact. So you still have a monolithic kernel, but from that point forward, they wanted to eliminate as much processing inside the kernel as they possibly could. NetMap is one of, one of the canonical examples here. Um, and, and that works to some extent. Uh, you won't get the performance you get out of Arrakis, uh, uh, mostly because you still at some point have to uh, call into the kernel. You have to make a system call, and that has some overhead, both direct as well as indirect. And um, what these people do uh, to mitigate that overhead is to do a lot of batching of, of system calls, which is always a trade-off you have to make. So it's kind of you optimize for, for throughput in that case, to, uh, uh, but you, you get worse latency. Um, to uh, mitigate the overhead of doing all these system calls. Thank you.
Jeff Kenning, Harvey Mudd College. Um, if I understand correctly, when you're mediating disk I.O. through Redis, that requires Redis to be able to be running. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, so what happens when I manage to screw up the config file so badly that Redis refuses to run? So uh, the, the idea is that um, this interface that I was talking about, I um, should probably quickly go back to that, um, this indirection interface here, um, even though I said it's provided by Redis, it's really provided by the library I.O. stack that runs inside Redis. And um, you could think, for example, to just fire up a little server that uh, contains nothing but that library uh, I.O. stack, and that exports the interface, and then you're still able to indirect via that to access the configuration file. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'm uh, other side again. <laughs> I'm uh, Aaron Carroll, Nick UNSW. Uh, related question, with, with the sharing of files, it seems like what you do is designate one process as the host for the file, if you like. Yeah. Does that mean that when I'm accessing a file from a different process that we're back to square one in terms of performance? Um, not quite back to square one. It's true that the, pro the process with the fastest access will be the one that has the library I.O. stack directly linked into the process. Um, this indirect IPC interface is going to add some overhead via this extra step of indirection. Um, there are ways to, to optimize that direct cost by, for example, putting the Emacs uh, uh, program on one core and then the um, the Redis program on, on another core is kind of uh, an outcome of, of the Bearfish uh, paper was to use very fast inter-process communication across cores. Uh, and then also keep in mind that this library I.O. stack that runs inside Redis is a very optimized one. So versus uh, using a gen generic uh, uh, I.O. stack, such as in Linux, you're still going to see speedups here. And uh, I think Peter Desnoyers. Okay, uh, one, one more, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Northeastern. Uh, so, how does this do for, uh, for instance, very high connection rate um, applications, say mm -hmm. a large web server? Yeah, uh, so I think what you're getting at, <coughs> great question, thank you, um, is uh, that the, um, uh, that if, if you think of it that every time you do a connect operation in a server, you might have to call into the control plane. That's not quite how, how we're doing this. Uh, the, the idea is that um, you basically configure these resource limits in, in much, much larger chunks. So you would say that, um, say, a web server will be allocated a range of port numbers that it can then allocate itself from just in user space. So when we're setting up the data plane, we say port numbers 1,000 to 2,000 go to this web server. And within that range, the web server is now free within user space without having to invoke the kernel to do its connection management and just allocate numbers. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much.